let us uh, look at more on uh, model testing today where we will be looking at topics on model validation, sense suit analysis and uh, policy analysis. I will give a brief on all these topics and like yesterday we will try to look at a couple of examples to reinforce our ideas on what is sense suit analysis and what is this policy analysis. Some of these things we have already been doing in the past, uh, we are just giving it a formal name and structure uh, right now. So, model validation talks about whether we build the right model. In verification, did we build the model right? That was a question. That means, given the specification, we want to check whether we captured all those requirements within our model. In model validation, we want to ensure that we model the correct problem. Uh, this largely corresponds testing of the model can replicate the past behavior as well as historical pattern. Three broad categories of tests are typically done when we are when we talk about model validation. Some of these things may have overlap with model verification. So, that is why when we actually talk about we say model verification and validation as a combined uh, activity with some uh, subtle differences are there. So, in model validation now the first test that we can try is something called a direct structure test. In this we are just going to observe the model structure that we have built without simulating the behavior and see whether uh, the structure makes sense. Second one is to look at structure oriented behaviors test with our understanding of structure if we can make some basic simulations does the behavior mimics the structure that we expect. Suppose, we have a positive feedback loop only then we can expect exponential growth is that really happening or if you have both positive and negative feedback loops uh, in the system then what kind of behaviors can occur and testing that out the structure under behavior tests. Uh, then behavior reproduction test that is to statistically compare the model output with past behavior and see whether we can actually represent the past as accurately as possible based on which we can then be more confident that it can uh, affect the uh, that it can be used to predict or uh, analyze what can happen in future. Uh, let us uh, take a little more detail look at this each of these uh, broad uh, test categories. The direct structure test is used to check if the relation assumptions are based on accepted theories and that all important variables are included in the model. Like for example, if you are setting up initial values, does initial values uh, uh, follow with uh, say for example, uh, what is actually been represented as initially available materials and stocks. Uh, if you are setting up some desired variables and uh, in reality people are following say little's law to use compute those variables uh, there is a model also include that. So, these can be tested without even simulating the model. First direct boundary adequacy test, test if boundaries are adequate that is all the important variables are endogenous. So, if your system has no controlling parameters nothing for you to control then you have attributed all the problems to something external on which you have no control of that means. You, you cannot improve the system unless externally somehow that system changes for the better to affect you. So, that cannot be the reason right. Even in case of demand in a common uh, inventory system or supply chain demand is considered external, but still people try to influence demand by offering reduction in the sale prices, uh, by timely locating the material at the right locations, uh, opening of multiple sales channels etcetera. So, they do try to influence the demand somehow. So, if that is essential part of doing the business then that has to be part of the entire model itself that is what the first one says. So, as soon as you look at the variables we can check whether should they be exogenous or endogenous if so then how do we include it. Direct structure assessment test, test if the structure conforms with the real system and uh, laws of nature if any like for example, uh, when deaths occur population has to reduce birth sucker population has to increase. So, those kind of laws of nature has to be abided by. Uh, if uh, births fall to 0 then population should not increase. It is good to check all those uh, uh, what can I say um, relations within the model that is what we mean direct structure assessment test. So, it is theoretical or empirical structure parameter confirmation test. A test if the structures and parameters have some real world uh, counterparts. Like we had built the 
now classical model on uh, uh, stock management structure. If you recall, we had two stocks in that. One is a work in process or supply line, then inventory, and then we took a decision saying that inventory is going to be adjusted based on desired inventory and actual inventory, and work in process will be adjusted by desired inventory, a uh, desired supply line and actual supply line. Uh, then we also had a forecasting component. So it is good to check whether the company is actually doing all that. Are the company having a forecasting module in it or not? Are they actually considering the inventory information, supply line information? To actually make the decisions. So, this is what we mean by uh, theoretical parameter confirmations. Like parameter we had used in that model, a parameter called as inventory coverage. So, by that we meant how much invent uh, weeks of inventory we need to have. So, the values you are using here is it realistic to what people are using? Maybe the for uh, simulation purpose we might have used some value, but for when you go to analysis and interpreting the results, is it a reasonable amount of inventory to hold? So, that is what we mean here. Direct extreme condition test, test without simulation of structure and equation makes sense under assumed extreme conditions or what the limits are for the model to be possible or useful. If demand is too high or demand falls to 0, uh, a birth rate falls to 0, so those kind of things what can happen or when backlog becomes too high, then what uh, kind of things could this model result in can be actually traced back. Phase validation, uh, test whether domain experts find the model structure and equation appropriate for intended purposes. See now we are now more in the model verification, when you look at verification it is in our hands, we look at the model, we play with the computers and figure out. Once it comes to validation, then we are looking at whether the model is going to be used by someone else out there who is going to use this model to make the key decisions, are we able to convince them. Even if we are consultants, we need to ensure that the client actually agrees to whatever the model. They can say no, no, this does not work, this does not uh, does not represent it. So, that has to be minimized, that will only come through dialogue. So, that is that part of test is called as phase validation when you look sit across table and try to convince them that this model structure actually captures what we intend to. These are some broad tests for direct structure tests. Second class is called as structure oriented behavior test. Test if modes of behavior or frequencies or mechanisms causing the behavior correspond to what would one expect right. If you have infectious diseases kind of models, then we do expect to S shaped growth there. For new product introduction, we ended up using S shaped growth because there is a positive feedback, but at a later time a negative feedback starts to dominate which results in a S shaped pattern. Um, so, the model should actually result in those kind of expected patterns of behavior. Like if there is large delays in the system, then we can expect some oscillation does it indeed occur. If there is no delays and still some oscillations are occurring, then we have to figure out what is happening there is it because of some non linearity introduced which inadvertently is causing some unexplained behaviors. So, one is the extreme condition test similar to what we observed the structure previous step, we can actually plug in run it and see whether the model is actually robust in those extreme conditions or uh, does it throw errors qualitative features analysis, test in a specific condition model generates a particular behavior. So, model we try to make it as generic as possible, but in reality we will find that only one scenario has occurred right. So, under that scenario we know what kind of behavior can occur. So, if we are able to plug that scenario into the model and we get a similar behavior under those conditions. Third is the behavior anomaly test, test if changing or deleting any assumptions lead to anomalous behaviors, is that assumption so critical? that uh, it is just uh, made a positive feedback system, negative feedback or things like that and does it make sense. Surprise behavior test, test if model is generating surprising behaviors. This is little more difficult to generate unless you generate large amount of scenarios, it is very difficult to figure out whether any surprises occur. But one is to see whether once you plug in numbers, once you look at the result, we need to spend time analyzing it that is what uh, today's lecture is about. Building the model is easy, but that alone is not the end to it. We need to spend some time outside the model to see whether the results actually make sense. There is a small blip in the model, you know, then we have to zoom in and understand why that blip is even occurring. Overall, the behavior may be okay, we are getting positive feedback, but maybe it goes up and then there is a small blip and then again it increases. 
then we may want to zoom in to figure out why or what caused that is it because of model structure integration issues etc etc family member test can model generate the behavior of other instances of same class of systems for example we are looking at uh, say infectious diseases model there are so many infectious diseases out there can the model be used for different kinds of infectious diseases can the model be used for infect disease at different locations by changing the parameters does it still make sense so more tests we are able to do and show that it covers a wider range then more generic the model becomes and more confident that it can be about the model that it can replicate so many scenarios and more if we have more confidence then we can be uh, more sure that what the model is saying we can actually use it for further analysis and things like behavior reproduction test basically this one has the straightforward ones where if you guys are more quantitatively inclined this is what may appeal to you to test statistically whether the model generates a behavior of interest we had used it in reverse when we tried to do the modeling for uh, i think it was part of our uh, new product introduction when you try to fit the curve uh, with the existing data to see whether we are getting the uh, to compute our values of uh, i think uh, coefficient of imitation and innovation uh, p and q in case of bas model uh, and then we used it to calculate p and q but other way suppose we get a some value of p and q we can use it to figure out whether it is able to correctly capture the behavior so um, so this is pretty much done to see that you know once once a model is built we want to have all the feedbacks so that the same can be used to explain what happened in the say the last 50 years or last 30 years so if we are able to reproduce that behavior as accurately as possible then we can have confidence that if i simulate the further 30 years and i'm going to use a similar structure then what our model predicts could be reasonable and if i'm going to introduce some changes in the model then i can expect that okay uh, all the changes are caused because of the intervention we are doing and nothing else so this another uh, popular mode of uh, behavior uh, reproduction test is used one of the dangers i need to say here about this behavior reproduction is it's quite a few it, is, it becomes very tempting as well as uh, difficult in a sense uh, we ended up overfitting that with the past data many times happens that you get the model and tune it so much that it very very accurately predicts the past data but in the process the meaning of all those parameters just went for a toss like maybe the best fit gave a value of p and q which uh for the uh, or uh, let us forget p and q let us involve uh, say infectious diseases model we are looking at contact rate as well as uh, the infectivity parameters can be computed using the past data uh, because of us trying to fit the data so hard to that contact rates and uh, infectivity parameters and we got some values we may later find that those values cannot exist in nature like the biologist doesn't agree that this is the true infectivity that can actually occur there's no other evidence to it the problem is because you overfitted to the given data maybe there is other feedbacks that is occurring which we forgot to capture so those are small dangers in trying to fit the model so tightly with the existing behavior right so that also has to be kept in mind some practical uh, things about checking this models is unfortunately or fortunately only the users or the modeler must critically assess the model boundary you have to decide what the model boundary has to be how much how long time horizon needs to be what is the simulation time step or is level of aggregation we need to use we want to build a factory model or each uh, assembly line in the factory has to be modeled or each machine level we have to model you only need to pick, pick up the level of aggregation various type of data is used in the model you must have seen by now we have numerical data which is what we are using but there is return and mental data that we use and try to capture this comes in the form of relations or multiplications that we do as a fudge factors and do some values between 0 to 1 we sketch the table functions and things like that um and these are all useful because most of or rather everything that we have in the simulation model we would like to have it a real world counterpart so that we can go ahead and measure it whether it is actually indeed happening or not and use it for further improving our model so that means whenever you use something then we need to have a 
name for that quantity we need to select select the scale of measure that is the units you need to state the reason for actually even you having those values and that gets closely tied up with model documentation it is not a printout of equation and graphs we need to list the assumptions that is happening like how often decision is being made we are indeed following exponential smoothing based uh, uh, what can a forecasting method right uh, in class we covered exponential smoothing but the actual world company may use some other forecasting method just because we know only exponential smoothing doesn't mean we only use exponential smoothing we then try to use a forecasting model which uh, mimics what they are having so these things come out when we actually write the assumption we assume that the forecasting exponential smoothing method with so much parameters and stuff like that uh, yeah e these are all very easy to say quite difficult to practice uh, sometimes it becomes innate meaning you keep practicing and as soon as you look at a model uh, you can see okay there is some structural anomalies but to get to there you have to practice so that's why we are playing with simple structures look at this structure we just start with first principles is it a first order system is there positive feedback is there negative feedback flows in and flows out then only certain behaviors can be done if model is showing any other behavior then we can be sure that or we can at least have doubted saying that no this doesn't look feel right and then once you get that feeling you have to act on it either you have to get more confidence in the model that what it's showing is right or you have to update the model to uh, confirm with uh, your beliefs uh, this is broadly what we can talk about as model validation so once you have a verified and valid model one of the most common and popular thing that we end up doing is called a sensitivity analysis sensitivity analysis is computation of the effect of changes in the input value or assumptions on the outputs typically we start with very small changes or typically change only one parameter value or one link or one assumption and see what is the impact of it within the entire dynamics so as to isolate the reasons uh, uh, the reasons or the effect of a single parameter changes uh, the change in assumptions whatever it, assumption can be any parameter value or anything if it results in only change in numerical value of the result that is called as numerical sensitivity if the pattern of behavior generated itself changes then it is called as behavior remote sensitivity yesterday in the muskrat example when we changed the what is it proportionality variable we got exponential growth or we got exponential decay or we got a stable parameter right so that is a behavior mode sensitivity and that behavior mode is sensitive to that uh, parameter value so the entire behavior changes but for certain parameters maybe it is exponential growth but only the numerical value changed after a few years maybe so then it is called numerical sensitivity if it reverses the impact of proposed policy it's called as policy sensitivity we we'll look at policy analysis uh, in a minute so this is broadly what sensitivity analysis is going to do and we will learn how to uh, change one parameter at a time and see how we can document and compare the results to see whether what is more sensitive or less sensitive to changes that we can see this slide actually summarizes what is actual use of us doing all this modeling and bottom building exercises that we are doing throughout the semester and beyond is as follows these are broad uses why we are even doing all the modeling is to make explicit assumptions and mental models that we may have to communicate uh, the mental or formal models to analyze and understand the link between structures and behaviors to test theories to generate possible futures and explore uncertainties risks and opportunities to design policies that improve system behavior to test robustness of the policies and their effectiveness in a deep uncertainty to experiment in virtual lab to train teach learn experience etc are all the broad purposes of model building the first few ones may seem quite abstract this is when you self learn but then you can for example go to the last one so using this models as a virtual lab you yourself can train games to understand what kind of dynamics is happening within the reality uh, or a supply chain or a small factory or how infectious disease spread right so that will give an idea because we can't gain real world experience in everything but it is important that you look at the model play with it and observe the reality in a better light 
like in campus i am not sure what happened last few years but a decade ago conjunctivitis outbreak is common come monsoon season uh, around that time there will be few cases of conjunctivitis and suddenly it is going to spike up and then it is going to come down and in fact so much that uh, the conjunctivitis uh, the, even the drug the medicine there will be small shortage because so many people get uh, infected which you can now understand much better because even if few people get it given the contact rate the amount the population density inside campus and hostels more people are eventually bound to get it before they actually seek treatment and then take precautions and without that it is not going to fall right so these are some simple models you can use to relate and observe what is happening in reality better so that's what the last point is trying to say so the two points highlighted in bold is after building all these models what we actually want to do is come up with better policies to improve our actual system that is in place test the robustness of it see how effective it is when things are becoming so uncertain right uh, for example concerning infectious diseases if suppose our hospital wants to know how much to stock and uh, because all these unfortunate medicines come with expiry date you can't stock infinite amount when you don't have space it's very expensive uh, so if you want to come up with some policies or to to control those infectious diseases what will be the most effective policies it is better to do kind of simulations and test these policies so before we actually test the policy we need to design the policies then we test it or simulate it and then we analyze the policies so policy design the first stage typically in policy design we need to incorporate suppose we know the policy like uh, for example infectious diseases the policy is if anybody gets infected they will be quarantined or kept in a separate room so that they can avoid contact with people yes so is it a good measure or not because quarantine whatever we do is going to cost money if it's a quarantine they need to ensure it is a uh, whatever a contact free room enough beds has to be provided in a facilities then people has to wear all masks this that so that the contact is all minimized then when the patient is identified as put in quarantine would that be better or should people do more vaccinations and awareness drives so what are the different policies that can adopt could be very large which is the most effective one we can help uncover and when we incorporate any of these policy designs within our simulation model we end up changing the things in simulation model uh over years people have done various kind of policy analysis and in policy what we want to do we want to introduce some sort of structural change in the model right there is some decision making happening we want to introduce some structural change so in decreasing order of effectiveness these are structural changes that typically helps in making high impact in your outcome the first one is adding breaking or changing information based feedback loops decision routines and boundaries of systems and responsibilities so once you have model we know what is the physical flow and we want to know what is the information flows here it says that the by changing it by modifying that information feedback part will have the maximum impact in your systems output the second one which can have the maximum impact could be adding breaking or changing the physical stock flow structures themselves do we really need to have so many levels of stock or is there way in which i can cut down one level within the system itself strengthening and weakening existing feedback loops under flow variables adding eliminating delays or smoothings change in high leverage policy parameters that is parameters that can be controlled by those involved and that have large effects for relatively small changes so as you identify them with sensitivity analysis so typically whatever policy analysis we do these are typical things we will end up affecting in our model since we built a model we will be able to figure out that okay these are feedback loops let us see where i can reduce this delay somewhere let us see where i can use this additional thing to make as information and make a better decision within the model our control theory is also very useful control engineering or control theory methods are also useful if for example the systems are all second order ode so we can actually do compute its eigen values and perform stability analysis you can do uh, what is it you can, can do z transforms for discrete even systems and calculate its stability boundaries uh, bounded input bounded output stability analysis can be done uh, there is bebo stability so all those things will be useful even here 
because the underlying system is differential equation or difference equation however you see it and what are control systems ideas you have you can figure out what are the boundary conditions for the uh, parameters which will result in stable behavior in system unstable behaviors oscillatory be patterns can also be computed using the control theory uh, ideas right for example if all the eigen value roots are positive and uh, then it uh, you know system is uh, unstable if it is uh, so like that you can compute it if it is negative then system is stable and so on uh, so this is also a form of policy design and testing we are looking at the extreme conditions so once you have these policies we need to test it with a simulation model a good practice is to build the policy in your model such that it can be switched on and off so it's a single model uh, policy on policy off we can have a variable please use different run names or different policy runs or dynamics are generated by different problems can be actually studied and compared checks robustness of the policy across many runs or parameter settings because it's not just one comparison we need to compare across various settings similar to sensitivity analysis for each policy uh, adaptive closed loop policies are more powerful than open loop ones as soon as you start closing the loop system will be more powerful than if you have open loop uh, so whenever there is a policy suggestion requested think of closed loop policies and remember sd modeling requires lot of reflection beyond the model on the behavior patterns because here it assumes that the, your real system is also quite structured and uh, it is going to behave the way we expect it to behave uh, but reality may not work like that people may not even agree to these results and there will be strong resistance to changes so how to even incorporate the policy changes within reality will require more reflection beyond what sd can actually uh, show so this is a broad summary or outline for how to do model from yesterday's class model debugging then verification validation and then moving on to sensitivity analysis or policy analysis it necessarily goes in that order because first we want to ensure that we have a verified debugged model without any errors and then it's valid enough based on accepted theories or based on real problem that we are making and once you are sure of that then we can do sensitivity analysis and policy analysis to uncover or understand the system better. Mm -hmm.